everyone. Uh, let's talk about Houdini. But in order for us to do so, we need to answer, what is Houdini? Well, the CSS tag Houdini task force, anyway. Well, according to their wonderful little website wiki, the objective of the CSS tag Houdini task force, CSS Houdini, or just Houdini, is to jointly develop features that explain the magic of styling and layout on the web. Magic. <laughs> Practically, though, what does that mean? It means extending CSS through JavaScript so that authors, like us, no longer have to wait a decade or more for standards, bodies, and browsers to do something new. But wait, you might say, can't we do this already? PostCSS does this, there are lots of JavaScript libraries that extend CSS, not quite. It's currently only possible, it's not currently possible, I should say, to extend CSS through JavaScript, only to write JavaScript that kind of mimics CSS actually polyfilling CSS or introducing new features like CSS Grid or whatever that next great layout is going to be is hard to do, if not impossible, especially in a way that's not just terrible for your user's performance. What Houdini is going to let us do is actually tap in to the CSS render engine, finally allowing us to extend CSS and do so at CSS engine speeds. The way that I like to think about it is much like service workers are a low-level JavaScript API for the browser's cache, Houdini is going to introduce low-level JavaScript APIs for the browser's render engine. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> so there are two people who've really helped me understand Houdini, and if you really want to understand Houdini, they're good people to look out for. One is Tab Atkins. He's a spec hacker at Google. At SASConf four years ago, he wrote down a Houdini spec that still isn't a spec, uh, and that got me really excited. And the other person is Surma, who is a web advocate and engineer at Google. Surma's been answering all of the questions I had about Houdini, especially because two of the big APIs I'm going to go over changed last week. So that's fun for a talk. Uh, but yeah, they're two great people if you want to keep up with Houdini to uh, go stalk on Twitter. Now, before I get going, a warning. Everything here is very early days. Nothing works. Uh, no compatible implementations exist. What actually works really only does so in Chrome Canary and really only does so if you've got experimental flags enabled. This deck's going to break if you look at it anywhere else. In fact, this deck might break even if you look at it there. The syntax changes a lot. Like I said, there were breaking API changes literally last week to this. Some of the examples that I'm going to provide, they're speculative at best based on what the current state of the specs are and based off of what some previous working implementations looked like. And they likely aren't going to necessarily represent final syntax. So terms and conditions apply, not redeemable for cash. Your mileage may vary. So is Houdini ready yet? No. <laughs> Unequivocally no. Uh, <laughs> Canary's furthest along. Chrome team uh, with Canary is furthest along. They've got some partial implementations. Um, in fact, if you dig in a little bit, uh, the stable version of Chrome right now actually has some working implementations of older versions of the Canary spec or of the Houdini specs. But no, Houdini is not ready yet. That being said, there it's, there's some good stuff on the horizon. Typed OM, which we're going to talk about, has three browsers interested in it. Uh, custom Paint. Pro, uh, and properties and values have a couple other, or have two uh, browsers implemented in it, or not implemented, I'm sorry, uh, interested in it. But there's kind of a lot still going on, so it's, it's not ready yet. But we're going to talk about it anyway, because it's cool. Part one, and the thing that kind of makes this all happen is worklets. They're itty bitty web ish workers. Worklets are extension points for our rendering engine. They're like web workers, except that they're much smaller in scope. They're designed to be parallelized and run on multiple threads, and they live in the global scope for the browser to use. They are code that we write that we don't call. It's code that we write specifically for the browser to call. The first bit of worklets is add module, and it looks like my font's a little small, so I'm going to bump it up one. The way that we add a worklet is we have window object in our browser, and then we have whatever the worklet is, and we call the add module function on that with a path to a relative worklet. This is going to load our worklet script into a worklet uh, thread. 
So worklet threads work off of different threads than our main rendering thread, which is why we can use them to extend our render engine. The same worklet may be loaded into multiple worklet threads for parallelization. This add module is also a promise, which means that after it's loaded, we can then work, uh, do work against it knowing that it's been loaded and is ready for us to use. This becomes important in some of the other specs that we're going to talk about a little bit later. A worklet itself, like I said, is kind of like a little tiny web worker. They have a function, register whatever the worklet name is. You provide it a name. That name is the thing that it's going to be able to call and identify this worklet as. And then we use a class. This JavaScript class has, depending on the worklet, specially named process functions that we can call, or sorry, that the browser will call based on the type of worklet it is. There are some arguments that get passed into it. Sometimes you return something, sometimes you don't. It looks like this. We have our render engine, and we have our main thread. Does this work? Yeah, it does. From that main thread, we're going to have our browser JavaScript. That browser JavaScript registers our worklet. That worklet then gets loaded into the main worklet threads, however many worklet threads we have, however many parallelized they are. You'll notice that the main thread is a separate process from the worklet threads. And then when our render engine wants to go use something from a worklet, it will call the worklet's process directly calling into that worklet thread. Our browser JavaScript never touches the stuff in the worklet thread once it gets loaded. Worklets, they're really the underlying foundation for which all of Houdini is based. They're the magic that makes them happen. It's really Houdini's secret sauce. Part two, the typed OM, aka CSS um, OM v2, the new hotlist, or big CSS. From the draft spec, converting CSS OM values, CSS object model values, uh, from strings into meaningfully typed JavaScript uh, representations and back and forth, they incur a really high performance overhead. What typed OM looks to do is expose CSS values as typed JavaScript to facilitate their performant manipulation. Typed OM exposes structures beyond simple strings for CSS values. These can be manipulated and achieved in a more performant way as part of the new CSS style value class and its subclasses. There are five main subclasses, keyword value, position, transform value, unit, and math value. Keyword value, it's a CSS keyword like inherit. Position, some of our CSS properties have positions, so we get X and Y positions here. Transform values and the subclasses of transform, like transform component, translation, rotation skew, that's transform, that's fairly straightforward. The CSS unit value represents either a united number, a raw number, or a percentage, basically the smallest bit of number that we can have. And then CSS math values are more complex versions of CSS unit values. They all wind up coming down to CSS unit values at the end. Think of things like calc and min and max. That's what gets handled by CSS math value. So if we take this example, we have an example with a background position of center bottom 10 pixels. If we grab that example, we have this new uh, attribute called attribute style map. It used to be called style map. It might go back. I'm not sure yet. But this attribute style map is our typed OM for this element. So with that, we can get the background position, and we can get its x value, which comes back as a CSS percent with a value of 50. It's centered. If we get the y value, it comes back as a more complex unit, a CSS math sum, which is a CSS percent of 100% all the way to the bottom, and a sum of CSS pixels negative 10, which brings it back up a little bit. The typed OM provides the underlying foundation to meaningfully uh, connect our CSS and our worklets. If worklets are Houdini's secret sauce, the typed OM are its chicken nuggets that let us scoop up the sauce without getting our fingers dirty. I really just wanted to use this GIF. This is a great GIF. <laughs> yeah, but what can I do with this? Well, turns out you can do some pretty rad stuff with worklets and typed OM. Part three the cool custom stuff. Please allow me to introduce you to window.css. Window.css is where all the new magic happens. So the first thing that window.css lets us do is work with CSS variables, or as we really should be thinking about them, CSS custom properties. With CSS custom properties spec, 
you can make snozberries taste like snozberries. The current situation with CSS variables or custom properties looks a little bit like this. We've got my color, and we set it to green. And then we have my color, and we set it to a URL. And then when we go to use it as a color, it all fails, and it's sad, because URL is not a color. But it's just a variable. It doesn't really know any better. Enter window.css.register property. What you can do with this is you can register a new property, a property that CSS will then understand as a property. In this case, we're going to call it my color, and we're give, going to give it a syntax of color. Now that we know that it's a color, now that we've registered it as a property, it will reject any value that doesn't match color, which is awesome. We now have created properly a new property. The structure of a registered property looks like this. We have a name. We have a syntax, which defaults to allow anything in. We can decide whether the property inherits up the DOM tree, and we can give it an initial value if we'd like. There are a bunch of different valid options for syntax. You've got lengths, you've got numbers, you've got percentages. You've got length percentages, which are stuff like calc. You've got colors, images, URLs, integers, angles, times, resolutions, transform lists, and custom idents. So if you want an ident that says awesome, you can create a custom ident that is awesome. Syntax allows combiners. So you can have a single item like length. You can have optionals like image or URL. If you've got idents, you can have all three of those ORed with the pipe. And then you can accept lists by adding a plus after any of your syntaxes. In practice, it looks a little bit like this. So we've registered a property called registered color. We're setting it to the color syntax. It's not going to inherit up the tree, and its initial value is Rebecca Purple. Now, I have this nifty little button here that I've styled. One of the advantages of registered properties is because it knows what syntaxes it's expecting, it can actually perform translations and animations, or transforms and animations on them. Or, sorry, third time, transitions and animations on them, uh, as you would expect. So if I hover over this, you'll see that it transitions nicely. If I change this to red, you'll see that it also transitions nicely. But now that this is a registered property, if I try and copy this URL and use that URL as the value of my registered property, you'll see that it defaults to Rebecca Purple because it knows that URL isn't a valid color. I've registered this to only accept colors. So it doesn't die, it doesn't fall back. It uses my initial value. It uses the value that it's expecting um, because it, or sorry, that I set it to because it doesn't find a valid color as a registered property. The next cool custom thing we can do is painting with CSS. It's if you want to draw in CSS, but like really for real. Question, have you ever really wanted to use canvas as a background or border in CSS? Now, I know the answer to this is no for most of you, but trust me, it's cool. Especially because when you use it through the Paint API, you get the styling and flexibility of an element with the scalability of an SVG. That's what the Paint API does. It lets us truly paint anywhere that we would use an image in CSS like it was Canvas. The Paint Worklet class looks a little bit like this. We have three optional statics that are going to be things that uh, our browser will call. One is input properties, and we can define what properties we want to look for, in this case, foo. We can also have arguments that we can pass into this newly generated or this newly available paint function to call one of our custom paints. And we can use the same syntaxes from registered property to define what we accept. We can also decide whether or not alpha is allowed. The special process function for the paint worklet class is called paint. And there are four, op or four potential arguments. One is context, which if you've ever worked with Canvas is basically the same thing as a canvas drawing context. One is size, which is the size of the box that we're drawing inside. Remember, everything in CSS is a box. The third one is our properties that get passed in from input properties. And the fourth one is args, which is a list of all the arguments that get passed in. So let's make one of these. Let's draw a circle. We're going to look for a property called circle color. We're going to take in the context, size, and properties. 
we're going to go get uh, from properties the circle color property. This is going to be a CSS style value. This is our typed OM. This is how we know that we're getting something that we can work with. I'm going to do a little bit of math to figure out the center point for the x and y axis, and then I'm going to figure out its radius, and then I'm going to start drawing like I would in Canvas. So I'm going to begin my path. I'm going to draw an arc. I'm going to fill the arc with whatever color is my registered property, and then I'm going to fill it in. Then, to get it to load up in my browser, window.css paintworklet.addmodule.js slash circle.js. And I get a red circle. And what's fun about this red circle is I can change it to a blue circle, or a green circle, if I can spell green, or a coffee circle, all without loading multiple images in, kind of just within CSS. Now, what's cool about this is you can register multiple paint worklets. So if I have one uh, green, I can draw a little face. And because it's a paint worklet, I can scale this face. And it'll be all happy. Well, my face is a little dopey. Uh, but it, it can all scale. I can change colors on the fly. All of this just by changing properties, or I'm showing arguments here, arguments of this paint worklet. You can even get a little crazy. Come on, text area. If I change this from face to warning, you can really draw some complicated things. Use anywhere would you want CSS images. You could use this as a border image if you wanted. This is the demo I worked on last night. And you can even color it as well, however you'd like. So you can have all these different permutations, be able to really draw complex things where you would want to use CSS images, all without cutting multiple images or doing it on JavaScript thread. It's done as part of the render agent's paint. OK, so things get a little fuzzier from here on out. We're going to start to talk about specs that have changed enough over the past month uh, that they don't have any working implementations anywhere, not even in Canary. The first really cool thing we're going to talk about is CSS Animation API. Because, yo dog, I heard you all like parallax. What does the Animation API let you do? Well, it lets you listen for user inputs, like scroll events, and then style elements based on that user input. And because it's done with a worklet, it's all off the main thread. No more jank for your users for, these, for this type of uh, effect. It's what's really going to make Parallax perform. Make it something that I won't yell at my designers for wanting to do because it's going to be terrible for performance. The animator class looks a little bit something like this. We've got a constructor with a, has options. This is going to work a little bit different than the Paint API. We're going to instantiate new animators. So this constructor is going to get called every time we instantiate an animator. And then it has an animate proper er, function, which takes current time and effect. Current time is the current timeline that we're working on. And I'll show you where that comes from in a minute. And the effect is a group of animation effects that we want to perform. It looks a little bit something like this. We're going to build a Twitter header. So a top bar that fades in as you scroll, and an avatar that goes from big to small sitting on that as we scroll. Constructor, we're going to get timings by creating a new cubic bezier function for ease out. Clamp is just an internal function we're going to use to find the minimum of three values. And our animate function is going to take in current time and effect. We're going to set scroll to the current time. And then our effects. The effects, it's a group of effects that we want to apply. The children are the individual effects. And what we're going to do is we're going to set their local time. Setting their local time sets a position in the keyframe effect um, as we're going. So we're going to set the actual individual time of the animation as it's happening. This is kind of the key. Instead of just building an animation and having it run, we are tying an animation directly to an animation's timeline directly to uh, user input of some sort. And this is where things start to get a little bit hairy. So we're going to load it like normal, window.animationworklet.addmodule. 
I don't know why it's not on window.css. I assume it'll eventually be. Twitter header uh, dot JavaScript. We're going to then off of it so we can start working. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to instantiate a new worklet animation. So this works a little bit different than paint that just kind of sits in the background. This we need to create new worklet animations each time. But that's OK, because that means we can reuse the same animation worklet for different animations. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create an array of effects that we want. So the way that we create effects is something called new keyframe effect, which comes from the web animations API. Keyframe effect lets us programmatically build an animation, starting by passing in what element we would like, then an array of effects that we would like, an array of changes that we would like to have. Those are our keyframes. And then we pass it a duration. So because we are controlling the timeline manually using uh, the timeline of our animation worklet, we want the duration to be one frame. And we want it to go once. So we have two different animations here, one for our avatar to make it scale, and one for our header to make it zoom in. The second argument we pass in is the timeline we want to use. Now, right now, there's only a scroll timeline, but they're working on other inputs like pointer events and touch events. The scroll timeline, you give it an element that we're going to be listening to scroll on, the time range we want, where we want to start scroll, and where we want to end our scroll. So all of this roughly creates something that looks like this. We have our scroll timeline, which is the main thing, the main wrapper that we're looking at. We have our header, which is uh, an invisible keyframe effect. We have our avatar, which is our other keyframe effect. We have other stuff on the page. And that little red bar is our scroll bar. It's our current timeline. And as our current timeline changes, as we scroll down the page, uh, the, our, our effects will respond in kind by having their timelines updated, which updates those keyframes in between. The HTML, it looks just like I described, wrapper div with some elements, and it winds up looking like this. This is a demo that Surma put together. So as I start to scroll, you'll start to see this header fade in and this avatar scale down. Uh-oh, this worked earlier. Perfect. I love the demo gods. But anyway, you see how this works. As we scroll, the timeline, oh, I know why. Here. There we go, because I zoomed in. And this is an iframe. So as we scroll, the header fades in, the avatar fades in. This is all done off of our main thread, because it's, the timeline's being changed in our worklet. And the timeline is our scroll position. We clamp it at a certain point, and then we just keep to get, on, keep to get going. That wasn't the right word either, but that's fine. And that is the nifty, awesome animation API. Now, we're going to talk about CSS layout. If you've been following along so far, I've taken about half of my time talking about four APIs. We're going to take the next 20 minutes to talk about one API, because this one's a big one. The CSS Layout API is displays your way. It literally is letting you make your own display property. This is how things get laid out on the web. I'm about to explain to you how things get laid out on the web. It'll let you do things like polyfill that awesome new layout spec that you want, or because I heard everyone likes a good masonry layout, it'll let you make one without any sort of performance hit. Now, this spec is crazy, crazy complicated. Uh, the spec title isn't even an editor's draft. It was literally August 29th, 2017, which is when this was updated, called A Collection of Interesting Ideas. <laughs> and to be fair, they're really interesting ideas. But because the reason I'm going to spend so much time talking about this is a lot of this is new terminology that we've likely never encountered before on the web. Uh, that we need to kind of understand in order for me to show you what the worklet looks like. But once you see this terminology and are familiar with it, then understanding the worklet is relatively straightforward. So there are a bunch of pieces of main terminology. The first one is current layout. Current layout is the algorithm for the box we are currently performing layout on. Seems straightforward. 
Then there's parent layout, which is the layout algorithm for the box's direct parent. It's the thing that's requesting current layout to be performed. Then there's child layout, which is the layout algorithm for the layout child of the current layout. And then there's layout child, which is different than child layout. I didn't write this, folks. This is their terminology. But a layout child is a CSS generated box before layout has occurred. There's a fragment, which is a container for layout information. This is where positioning happens. There's layout edges, which is the size of the box model for the current box being laid out. And there's constraint space, which is the available space for the current layout to take place in. It looks like this. We have our parent layout, whatever that box is. And inside that box, there is space that we can put stuff into. That space is determined by things like padding and borders. Those padding and borders, maybe scroll bars as well, those are our layout edges. The constraint space is the space inside. We've got elements inside that constraint space. Those are all the current layouts. Those are all the things that our parent layout is asking layout to be performed on. Current layout translates into child layout, which is the styling for the actual item. Child layout creates layout child. Layout child we can then call a function on to create a fragment to actually position a box around. Let's dive into layout child. Layout child doesn't contain any information itself. Uh, instead, it's used to generate fragments, which is what we use to actually position stuff. It has all of the computed styles uh, for that element on uh, its style map, style map being its typed OM. It also has layout next fragment, which we're going to call in a minute to actually generate our fragments. Layout child can be generated a number of different ways. It can be generated by an element, a root inline box, which is a grouping of text, for instance. And it can also be generated from before or after pseudo elements or any anonymous box that's been blockified. So think things like display table cell that don't have a parent. All of the children of the current box get passed in to our layout worklet as an array of layout children uh, for us to then go use. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Here we have a box with a before, and we have an image. Here there are three layout children. One for the div, one for the div's before pseudo element, and one for the image. On this, we have a string of text that has some spans and a break inside. Here we only have one layout child because it's the root inline box, that set of text. The spans and the breaks, those are children of that single root inline box. Fragments, fragments are what we actually can use to do positioning. So to perform layout on a box, to perform layout on a layout child, we call layout next fragment. And that produces a fragment. Fragments contain inline size and block size attributes, which are set by the layout al algorithm and cannot be changed. The key thing about this layout API is when you're writing layouts, you're just dealing with position. You're not dealing with size. Size is dealt with by the render engine. Now, if you're not familiar with the terms inline and block, they come from a CSS spec uh, for abstract dimensions. Uh, inline elements are elements that go with uh, the flow of the text direction. Block is uh, perpendicular. So for right to left or left to right languages, inline size is roughly your width, and block size is your height. We can position fragments by setting their inline offset and their block offset, which defaults to zero. So let's take a look at some uh, fragment stuff. So here we have a div with a container and then inside, or div with an ID of container, and inside of there we've got our layout API. We're calling uh, our custom layout foo on that layout API, and it's going to have an inline size of 50. Why is it going to have an inline size of 50? Because its parent has a height and width of 100 pixels. It has margin on either side of 20 pixels, so 100 minus 20, uh, minus 20 again, so margin on either side. And its parent has 
padding of five pixels. So there's five pixels on either side for the parent, 20 pixels on either side for the child, 100 minus 50 is 50. This slightly more complicated uh, example, our container still has a height and width of 100 pixels, but then we've positioned, absoluted our layout API inside of that container. And because we've positioned, absoluted it with top, bottom, left, and right, uh, it still only has an inline size equal to whatever the available space inside is, which is going to be 100 minus 10 on each side. So that's 80, 80 on top, 80 on bottom, left, right. Inline size, block size, all equal to 80. Good. Glad you're coming with me. I know that this is complicated, but trust me, the payout's worth it at the end. Uh, layout and these inline offsets are relative to their parents. So if we have a container that's positioned uh, 20 pixels to the left and 30 pixels down, if we have a child inside of there that has a top and left position as well, its final position is going to be uh, its parent's position plus whatever its position is. So 20 plus 5, 30 plus 10 is going to be 25 and 40. Layout edges, they include your border, your scroll bar, and your padding attributes, and their respective widths. It also includes an all attribute, which represents the sum of, the sum of everything. So you can get all of the block edges, all of the inline edges, or you can just get the border or the padding or the scroll bars. Layout si uh, edge sizes, which are each one of these items, uh, is an object that represents the width in CSS pixels of an edge in the inline start, inline end, block start, and block end positions, which are start end, start end. Layout edge sizes also includes the inline and block attributes, which represents all of their sums. So if we take a look at this example, width 50 pixels, height 50 pixels of the container, padding 10%, border solid 2 pixels, overflow Y scroll. The edges dot padding dot inline start, where our padding is going to start, is 10% uh, times 50 pixels, which is 5 pixels. That's the start of our inline padding. Our block end is going to happen at 2 pixels. The scroll bar's inline end kind of depends on the user agent. It's either going to be 0 or greater than 0. And then all of the block sizing is going to be 14, because it's two pixels on either side for the border, plus five pixels on either side for the padding. Cool. One more, and then we can start talking about fun stuff. Constraint space. Constraint space is passed in and represents the available space for the current layout to perform layout inside. Percentage in line size and percentage block size are the percentages a layout can resolve against. It's the actual area that's available. Block fragment type will dictate whether the current layout should produce a fragment at any given block size. And it may choose not to if it has something like break, avoid, or break inside a void attached to it. Finally, use some utilities. Resolve inline size just gets the inline size based on constraint space and a style map. Resolve block size does the same thing. And resolve length does the same thing. It gives you a CSS style value for whatever the length is. Cool. We're all set up now. We're ready to start talking about the worklet. The worklet, <laughs> right? So it's not as crazy as it looks. It's just all very commented. So the first items are the input properties. These are the things we want to look for. Second is children input properties. So for things like grid, where you have uh, some properties on the parent and some properties on the child, you're going to need both of those to calculate the position correctly. So this gives us the ability to do that. And then we can decide whether the child display of that layout, or how to dictate that. So normal means inline stuff is inline stuff. Uh, block means everything gets blockified. Like if you're in Flexbox or Grid, all of its children get blockified. Next up is we have the actual functions. Now, for the layout process, all of these things are generators. And they're generators to support asynchronous and parallel layout engines. The intrinsic size generator actually comes from a separate spec for intrinsic sizes. And intrinsic size determines how a box fits its content, uh, specifically inside of the context of the layout it's in. And we get children and style map here. And then layout is 
space, the available constraint space for this layout. Children, what the layout children are. Its style map, its edges, and the break token, which we just talked about. Uh, might be good for something like pagination uh, or printing. If we look at the worklet, we are going to register our class, and we're going to register this to be block-like. It's intrinsic sizes. We're going to yield and get the actual intrinsic sizes for each one of the children. We're going to find the largest intrinsic size and then the smallest intrinsic size. And we're going to return the largest and smallest intrinsic size, uh, this being the largest area that the content, or that the box can be in an infinite space, that it won't have any unused extra space for the content, and minimum being the smallest size that we can have a block with its content uh, without overflowing its content. Next, we have our layout. We're going to get, we're going to resolve the inline size of our element, and then we are going to get the content area inside of its edges. So our inline size is our available inline size minus edges all in line. Block size is going to be the same thing. This gives us a new constraint space within our box that we're laying out. And we're going to create that new constraint space, and that's going to be what's available for each one of our children. So we're going to loop over each one of our ch uh, layout children, and we're going to call layout next fragment on it to build fragments for all of our children based on the available size of the element we're in. Then we're going to look at our block offset. We're going to start our block offset by wherever the block start of our element is from our edges. And then we're going to loop over each one of our fragments. We're going to set its block offset to whatever that block offset is, just kind of going down a line. And we're going to center our element by taking its inline offset and figuring out whether inline start is more or whether the centered block size is more. And at the end of that loop, we're going to increase the block offset. So whatever the size of our fragment was, we're going to add a new one at the bottom. Just pop whatever the, the size is down. Finally, we are going to add uh, the edges all back, or block end, to our block size. And this is going to take where we start all of our content laid out and then where we want to end and set that to a new size that we can then use. And we're going to resolve the block size of our element based on those constraints. And we're going to return its inline size, its block size, and its child fragments. So that layout produces this. We have our layout block light, which is block like, which is that box. We have our constraint space inside with the blue edges in line all, or all in line and all block. We start where block starts, and then we lay out our fragments. They're going to be centered in our constraint space, one right on top of another, until we get to the end, and then that's the size of our block. <sighs> Good, that's a lot. So, with Houdini, the future is pretty bright, even if it took 20 minutes to explain how we lay stuff out on the web. And we should get excited for it, because this is going to open up all new sorts of design possibilities for us, all new sorts of engineering possibilities for us that we can't really do today. Imagine how big CSS Grid has been for us already, times you being able to do whatever you'd like with layout, or animation, or paint, or combining them. It's really going to give us a whole set of new magic tricks that we can use uh, when designing and developing for the web. Thank you.